Okay, can everyone hear me? At the back, yes? Sweet. Um, so before, before I get into any real details, I'm, I'm going to keep this informal. Um, we'll ask questions at the end for sure, but if you, have, if you have a question and if it's a quick one, just throw your hand up and I'll answer it right then and there because I will be getting into some technical details. Now, before I get into any of those, let me just tell you a bit about me, how I got here, um, and how my journey sort of differentiates from most. Oh. So, when I first started, um, I wasn't, I'm not a typical entrepreneur by any means. A lot of you guys, you know, you're coming to this conference, you've, some of you have built your own websites, some of you are mining cryptocurrency, some of you are doing some really, really insane stuff. I did none of that. All, all that mattered to me while I was in my high school was playing soccer, playing badminton, and that was my life. So I didn't know entrepreneurship was a thing until I got into university. Um, and when I did, um, I started my first sort of research idea that eventually became a company in the genetic engineering space in second year. So this is when the $1,000 genome was the big and sexy thing. And the big focus was how do we get cost of genetic testing cheaper? Um, genetic testing has tons and tons of benefits. We understand very little about it, but at the same time, we can predict a lot about our, about our health and how we can potentially prevent it. So, turns out, six months into the company, we learned a variety of things. We had another group beat us out out of Harvard. Um, it was a massive, massive failure, but learned a lot along the way. Um, so, took my first swing, got struck out, uh, and decided to start something even more crazier, a second company. Um, but before I did that, I felt like I needed to get a bunch of experience, so I started the first life sciences incubator, the deep tech incubator in Waterloo, called Velocity Science. So I helped start that and worked with one of the greatest startup ecosystems in the country, which was a really, really exciting experience, especially because I got to work with entrepreneurs and see them from the sidelines, the mistakes that we're making, all the way out to the problems they're facing and how they go out and solving those problems. Um, and through that, I found my co-founder who did research in nanotechnology, worked, he was sort of the genius of the group, worked anywhere from Harvard University all the way out to Xerox Research Center and has done some amazing things. Um, and now I work on a company called Medela Health with him. Um, and what we do is we make a contact lens that continuously and non-invasively monitors glucose levels and transmits that information to a mobile phone so that patients can better manage their health. The goal is to start with a contact lens but expand into many, many other biomarkers so you have a complete picture of your health. Um, but that's just my entrepreneurship journey. In order to get here, I had to accumulate a lot of experiences along the way. Um, and a quick summary of that is my very first job was in high school. I worked in healthcare. I worked at the local diabetes clinic. Um, I worked in eHealth Ontario. I worked in eHealth in Vancouver. I worked with the university to set up that incubator. And eventually, I helped start Velocity Science and then Medela. Um, but I didn't know any of that. I didn't know I was going to do these things. Um, with my career, it wasn't like I was planning this, although when I put it like this, it seems like one thing led to another. Turns out you can't connect the dots going forward. Um, so keep that in mind, is when things happen, take all the knowledge that you have available to you when you have it, and eventually it will come into something meaningful, and you just have to trust your intuition on that. So I told you a bit about Medela Health. That's the prototype. Um, maybe you've seen it, maybe you haven't. Um, but I'll get a little technical on how it works and why we care about doing this. So the way a smart contact lens works is basically it has three main elements. So you put the contact lens on, you have a small clip on your collar, and it sends the signal out to your mobile phone from the clip. Um, and the reason why we need this here is because of the way communication happens. Um, you don't want it to happen at a high frequency to hurt your eyes. That's why we keep it separate. And the contact lens itself is made up of three parts. So anything on the, the three left things, uh, three things on the left of the image, the sensor, the ASIC, and the antenna are all small micro components within the smart lens. Um, and then everything on the right is the peripheral. So what goes into the reader and that allows us to communicate to the smartphone. Um, the sensor is the magic. 
is where the magic happens. It's what's able to sense uh, the glucose and future other biomarkers. The ASIC chip is sort of like the brain of the device that does, that does some processing and it sends that information to the antenna, and the antenna then sends that information out. Um, so highly, highly technical stuff. Uh, and you must be thinking, like, what is a dropout doing building this type of technology? And the key, key is, school is great, and it's really, really fascinating. You meet great, meet great people. But it turns out you can learn just about anything via the internet um, and can hire people with experience and work with them, people who are way smarter than you, to help build you technology like this. Um, which is a big, big takeaway message. So don't be discouraged by crazy big ideas, crazy deep technology, um, while you have the internet in front of you to help you along this journey. So I see two big applications of this. One is what I call vertical data organization. So it's monitoring your glucose um, can create a trend as time goes on. What's really exciting is when we expand into other biomarkers, monitor, for example, cortisol and how that fluctuates through the day. So you can monitor your stress or how you can do osmolarity to monitor inflammation. You can know very deeply about every individual's health. To me, what's crazy right now is you can open your smartphone and I can know about your ad preferences, where you click, how often you're going to click, but we have no idea about any of your health markers right now. It's just sort of things we guess, and usually we go to the doctor when it's too late. The second really interesting thing is what I called horizontal data organization. This is how can my data, my health data, help someone else? So in my eHealth days, one of the projects my team worked on was a data organization problem. Specifically, um, we took data sets from every emergency clinic in Vancouver and the, some of the surrounding suburbs. And we, measured, we monitored anywhere from people coughing all the way out to people getting heart attacks and all the conditions in between. And what we found was really, really interesting stuff. We could predict how we, could, how we were, how diseases were transmitted um, and how they grew across those particular regions just by these static data points. Um, and this could help hospitals you know, prepare for you know, potential flu outbreaks all the way out to staffing. Um, and that's really, really exciting. Now we see that in a different light. Imagine now if everyone around here is wearing a contact lens and we're monitoring these multiple biomarkers, we can have that data at a much, much higher resolution and be significantly more accurate by that level of prediction. Oh, someone has a question. We weren't able to predict those. So we were, we, were, we were capturing emergency room data, so tagging information specifically, such as, you know, this person has these, these, these symptoms, and it's probably this disease. So what we were able to predict specifically was the movement of flu that summer across region in Vancouver. So we could say things like, the point of emergence of these diseases in downtown Vancouver, and another point of emergence is in, let's say, Surrey and we're, expanding, we're expecting it to hit this hospital by this period of time. Um, we could build that type of analysis. It didn't get to a specific level of detail because we, as you quite rightly said, we lacked high amounts of data. Yeah. Um, another question. Yes, good question. So the question was, uh, I'll repeat it just for everyone. Can you send alerts using the system? Yes. Um, specifically, when you're monitoring your glucose levels, the reason why people faint from time to time is because your glucose drops. And um, basically, that's when you get dizzy and you can potentially faint. Uh, that happens quite often. Um, so like, why do I do this? Why do I care about this? And it's mainly because of this very general thought of we live in this world of what I call reactive medicine. We only go to the doctor only when things go wrong. Um, in my opinion, this should be flipped into our heads. We need to build towards a preventative model of care where you 
don't have to go, to go to the doctor only when things go wrong, but they're more consultants to you um, and telling you how to optimize your health as opposed to just managing things that you've done wrong. And the way to do this is by having that data. So, I mean, if you Google like preventative medicine now, you'd see articles like this. And these are quite old articles. We've actually created a journal called American Journal of Preventative Medicine. And um, there's tons of interesting articles in it, but it's very, very theoretical work. I'll get to your question in one second. Let me make a point. Um, what's really, really e exciting is these, there's tons of these publications, but there's not enough action on it. It's been very, very theoretical. So it, it, it makes me ask the question, why hasn't preventative medicine happened? And I can summarize it in the following way. Um, the, the three blockers of preventative medicine are one, there's a problem of data collection. Having high quality data that can, that can tell us about our health. So putting our phone beside our bed to monitor how we sleep or how much we've walked through a day is simply not enough. Second is the problem of data organization. So being able to take that data and convert it into information to drive insights. And that's where what Karthik was saying around AI comes extremely, extremely helpful. And the third, and this is the most complicated one, is health economics, how we incentivize different people within our systems, whether that be our payers, so insurance companies, governments, our clinicians, and as well as the patients. So how many of you have gone to the doctor and they've done a subpar job or let you out way too quickly? Has that happened to anyone? So, okay, tons of hands go up. And the reason for that is doctors are built by the patients they see, they aren't built by ours. So they're incentivized to get you out of the door as quickly as possible so they can make the most money. There's some ways that we're changing that now, but it's a long time coming. So these are the three main blockers. Someone here had a question, so I'll answer that and then move on to the next point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good question. So the question was, um, how, how long does it take to build and sort of launch the contact, smart contact lens? And the answer is tricky, but I'll answer it to the best of my ability. So the technology is there. We're, we're ready with the prototype. Um, there's still some iterations we need to do on it. It's, it's still under development. But the key limiting factor is how regulatory bodies look at new devices. Uh, and technically, I should add that as a fourth blocker of preventative medicine, is how our regulatory systems are set up. Um, it's very hard to get new innovations out the door because health and safety are regulated in a very, very different way. And I won't get into the details of that because I'll need a lawyer here. Um, but generally speaking, it's extremely, extremely difficult to get new devices out that have never been done before. The cool thing about these blockers of preventative medicine is the first two can be solved by technology. The third one is more of an economic thing, but the first two are a set of problems that we can go out and solve. And this is where I look to you guys. If you're interested in healthcare and solving the problem of preventative medicine, generally speaking, you're solving one of these problems using technologies. How do we collect more high quality data, building better sensors, um, or two, the problem of data organization. How do you convert health data into information that patients, providers, and um, payers can use? So it's a very, very different way of looking at healthcare as how it's typically looked. Question in the back. I'll show you a prototype after this talk. So, by the way, come, I know a lot of people have questions about the prototype. Let me come show you a prototype uh, once the talk is done. Question two, you're keen, I like it. Um, right now the costs are high, um, but we anticipate final cost to be lower than what an average diabetes patient spends. So an average diabetes patient spends something like, um, a type 1 diabetes patient spends $4,000 per year to monitor their health. 
a type 2 diabetes patient spends about $2,000. We expect it to be on par with existing monitoring systems without sort of the, the invasive aspect. Okay, I'm getting a lot of questions. Maybe this wasn't the greatest idea to ask questions as we're going on. So I'll promise to take your questions sort of after the talk. I didn't know I, I would be so interesting to you guys. This is great, I love it. And I know you guys really want that VR headset, so keep up the good work. Um, oh, so we believe that this is one of the key things that will go out and solve the future of the, the preventative healthcare problem is devices like this that are sensor driven, that solve the data collection problem and create the infrastructure to save the data organization problem. But it's not just going to be us. I think there's an ecosystem of companies that will go out and solve this problem. On one hand, you have genetic monitoring companies, so things that sequence your DNA, um, understand your system from the, your cells from the inside out, and then biochemical monitoring. So things like our body excretes tons and tons of biochemicals that we can detect, for example, glucose, that we can detect, and that tells us a story about our health. So this is the spectrum of data collection problems that we need to go out and solve. So I've sort of given you a very general idea on sort of where the healthcare system stands today. I think what steps we need to do to take our healthcare system to the next level. Um, but specifically, um, I want to talk about you guys for a second, and I'll go off script. As, as someone as young as you, you might feel you don't have the resources or the necessary capital or all these other things, and I'm going to break that bubble of yours, because I think that bubble has been created by society way too strongly. It's good in communities like this where speakers are breaking that, but let me take it one step further. Um, you all understand that the world is changing. It's changing at an immense pace. Um, technology is eating the world. Um, we see that by, you know, Uber. You know, it's now, I think, last I checked, it was um, over a $100 billion company without owning a single taxi, whereas Yellow Cab, the largest taxi company, has been around for over half a century, and it's never reached that type of market cap. Same thing can be said about Airbnb. Same thing can be said about a gazillion other tech companies. Um, and it's changing at an, a pace like any others. You've heard some amazing speakers get on stage, tell you about their technology. But what I would like to hear if I was in your shoes, if I was speaking to a younger version of myself, here's what I would tell him. And that's what I want to share with you. First lesson for me would be learn to learn. Um, school is great. Um, it teaches you a lot of things. Um, but it's up to you to teach yourself how you learn and how you learn quickly. And it can be broken down by literally one chart. Um, it's this. It's I call it the magical learning curve. When you first start off with learning a new topic, it's ex for the amount of time that you spend on it, um, the, the more knowledge you will get. And you'll, you can get to a really, really good part, a really, really good understanding of a particular topic fairly quickly. But in order to be an expert, it takes a lot of energy. So it's the 80-20 rule. It takes you 20% of the time to learn 80% of something and learn it very, very quickly. But the last 20% is what PhDs and grad students and postdocs spend years and years learning about. Um, and thanks to the internet, you guys really have no excuse. You can go out and learn just about anything that you want. Second, let's talk about passion for a second. Anyone know? Anyone know the people on the left? Yeah. The Wright brothers, yes. Anyone know the person on the right? I'm not sure, but I think Eiffel. I'm sorry? No. So that is Samuel Langley. And what most people don't know is sort of how the aircraft came about. The Wright brothers built it out of their garage and their farm and their barn. Um, where Samuel Langley was funded by the British government with tons and tons of resources. Why did the Wright brothers figure it out out of a small barn, whereas Samuel Langley, who had a blank check, couldn't figure it out? And the answer was simple. It's, he didn't have the passion, um, passion the same way the Wright brothers did. So 
I get this argument all the time. It's like, Harry, like, I get it. I know I need to be passionate, but like, how do I find my passion? I have so many interests, how do I actually convert that? And the simple answer is you have to try as many things as possible. This, the next 10 years of your life, you're in this state where you will go through, you know, 18 hours of like working time and you will be able to pull that off and get like six hours of sleep and still be able to function and operate like a normal human being the next day. You have that capacity because you're young, you're energetic, and you're unlike any other part of your life. So you have energy that nobody else has. Um, so you can try as many things as possible within those 18 hours and figure it out over the next couple of years. The final thing I want to say is take all advice with a grain of salt, including this one. So you've heard tons of people come up here, tell you to go into this area, tell to go into that area, um, but take it all with a grain of salt because we're all limited by our biases. Um, and that's a big, big thing that you should keep in mind when you're taking any piece of advice. So we're facing these major challenges um, anywhere from climate change all the way out to general AI. Um, but I think what's really, really motivating is you guys have the power to step up and go change this. Before I end off, this is the one quote that I want to end with that I think you guys will really like. Um, and it goes as following. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who, who, are, who, who look at things differently. They're not fond of the status quo. You can quote them, you can disagree with them, you can glorify them or vilify them. About the only thing you cannot do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as crazy ones, we see genius because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Thank you. Amazing. So Harry, I have a question for you about preventative medicine, yes. right, going back to what you were doing. So we talked about monitoring a lot, right? Um, and then there's also interpreting, and then there's also delivery. So when we think about preventative medicine in the next three or four years, where is that heading on a macro scale? Right. What are some trends? How can these young people get involved? So I think I mentioned it very generally in my talk, but I think the first problem that we need to solve is the problem of data collection. So let me take a running jump at that because there's tons and tons of companies working on the data organization problem because all you need is a computer. Tons of e-health companies exist. Highly, highly competitive space. If you ask any investor who's invested in digital health, they will tell you that. What most people are not focusing on is the data collection problem because A, it's significantly harder to solve, but B, it also, for that high risk, there's also a high reward out there. And that's the mentality by which we focused on. There's a lot of hype cycles in any sort of technology industry. I think the key here, especially in healthcare, is you know, canceling the noise and getting the signal. And that signal, at least in my opinion, is solving the data collection problem. So we set ourselves up to solve the data organization problem. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Harry. Cheers. This is great. Thank you.